been looking at protein assessment and looking at the relationship between dietary protein and body protein. And it may seem obvious that we need dietary protein to make body protein, but the link between them is much more complicated. So we need to look and re uh, refresh ourselves about how they are linked uh, and generally. So we know we're going to be consuming dietary protein from all kinds of foods, from our, obviously our, our protein foods, our eggs and cheese and milk, but also from things such as beans and our grains. And when we consume those proteins, they're going to be a very folded, complicated molecule. Once we consume it, it's going to hit the stomach. The stomach is going to unfold that protein through that process called denaturation. And then we get to the small intestines, and those amino acids are ripped apart. And we get the individual amino acids that will be absorbed. It's going to hit the liver first and then being dispersed throughout the body. And we will sometimes collectively call all those individual amino acids throughout the body the amino acid pool. Now there is no such thing as an amino acid pool anywhere in your body. It is just collectively the individual amino acids that you'd find within cells and within the blood. This, if we could categorize every amino acid in your body, only about 1% of all the amino acids in your body would be in this pool. It is from this pool that we are going to pull to make body proteins. But we can't just think that, oh, I eat more dietary protein, I'll get a, a larger amount of amino acid pool, and I'll make more bar body protein, because this is very controlled. This is occurring inside cells, and those cells, the DNAs of those cells, are really going to control that, how much is being produced. The other thing we have to remember is the body constantly turning over. So it will take the, the proteins within the, those cells and break them down and release those amino acids back into this amino acid pool. Again, this is a mythical pool. There is no such place like that in the body. But it is from this pool that the body is going to be using to form proteins. But it will not allow them to sit there forever. We are, are going to either use those amino acids or we're going to process them. Generally, when you eat a protein, the amino acids within that dietary protein would be used within about a day uh, or it's going to be processed. So what's going to happen? Let's say that this is an extra amino acid. This is more than what you need. We're going to take this amino acid and we're going to separate the nitrogen from the carbon backbone. Go back and look at that basic structure of the amino acid and understand that carbon backbone. And we can do various things with this. We can make, use energy, four calories per gram. We can convert it to glucose. We can convert it to body fat. So that's our, our basic metabolism, what we can do with extra amino acid. But I want to speak more about this part of the amino acid. We're going to take off that nitrogen through deamination. We're going to convert it to urea. And we're going to excrete that in the urine. And we can actually measure that in something called urinary urea nitrogen. And, in this, and now we have a mechanism for kind of comparing how much protein and nitrogen that's coming from our protein and how much is being excreted, and we can relate these. If we eat more, uh, we don't just make more body protein, we'll have more amino acids and we'll have more urea. So they tend to follow one another, more dietary protein, more urinary urea, less, less. And we are going to use that to try and assess our protein status. That was a review of the link between dietary protein and body protein. When the amount of body protein is stable, urinary urea nitrogen reflects the amount of dietary protein consumed. Protein status and related malnutrition, however, is more than just inadequate protein intake. It's related to a general loss of lean body mass. And to understand this, we need to first understand different types of body protein and how they are impacted by a low intake of protein and or energy. So let's take a look at those categories of body protein. There are multiple methods used to categorize body proteins. One way is by their overall type of function, structural proteins versus regulatory proteins. Examples of structural proteins would include the muscles in the skeletal system, skin and collagen. Examples of regulatory proteins would include hormones, enzymes, and carrier molecules. Another way to categorize proteins, though, is called the compartmental model. And this model has two primary compartments called somatic and visceral. Most somatic proteins are those structural proteins, such as the skeletal muscles. Visceral proteins would include those regulatory body proteins, but also would include things like the organs and your blood proteins. Here's a summary table with how the body proteins are distributed using this compartmental method. 
So we can see that the muscle and the visceral, the somatic and the visceral, are about half of our overall body proteins. But there are a lot of body tissues, a lot of body protein that don't really fit into either of those. So the skin, skeletal, cartilage. Now this is interesting, but it can be misleading if we were to conclude that the distribution reflects their importance, especially if it relates to protein malnutrition and assessing protein status. So here are two more columns with information related to how much of the overall daily protein synthesis is linked with these various categories and how much of functional and metabolic activity occurs from these different various categories. And these two final categories provide a much better understanding of the types of body proteins that are vulnerable to inadequate intake of protein and or energy. So these are the ones we're going to use to assess protein malnutrition. But before we look at this specifically, let's go back and review the classic steps of nutrient deficiency. If you have an inadequate intake or an increased need that you can't meet by your dietary intake, we are going to first pull upon those stores. Then we're going to have altered physiological and metabolic pathways. Uh, and then that will probably lead to alterations and reduced tissue and protein production, such as your muscle and your viscera. We will then have altered growth. Um, and body composition will change, finally lead to increased morbidity, sickness, and death. Compare that to the stages of protein deficiency. As with the classic stages, the first step is inadequate intake, or an inability to meet an increased need. The second stage is where the differences start. Unlike fat and carbohydrates, we have no dispensable stores of protein or amino acids on the body, so there's no stage of reduced stores for protein deficiencies. The first metabolic alteration will be a drop in urinary urea. Given that urinary urea follows the amount of protein intake, when you have a low intake or a deficient intake, there will be lower levels of urinary urea. The next stage of protein deficiency will be a loss of somatic tissue or those muscles, muscle mass. Muscle protein is catabolized or, or broken down in deference to maintaining the functional uh, proteins, including those regulatory and plasma proteins. With severe protein deficiency malnutrition, there will eventually be those physiological and metabolic changes in plasma proteins, but those are linked with those final two steps of morbidity and death. So these are our stages of protein deficiencies, some similarities to the classic stages, but we have distinct characteristics. So now I'm going to go through each stage of protein deficiency and describe the various methods that can be used to measure changes that are occurring at that stage. And we'll start with assessing dietary intake. As with all of our standards for adequacy, our standard for protein is going to be the RDAs. So RDAs for healthy adults is going to be 0.8 grams of protein per kg body weight. We can also use the AMDRs, the Acceptable Macronutrient Distribution Range, and it's shown that if we have 10 to 35 percent of our total calories coming from protein, that usually meets our needs. That does assume that we have adequate energy intake. Those are the guidelines that we have for healthy adults. But we want to take a look at other special considerations that might have a need beyond the RDAs. For example, athletes and elderly. The RDAs do not change for those groups, but if you take a look at other professional organizations and other research, more recent research, they would indicate that those groups would have a need beyond the RDAs. And then pregnancy and lactation, the RDAs indicate there's a higher need than the typical healthy adult. The next stage then would be that drop in the urinary urea nitrogen. And we would have normal ranges can be quite quite wide because we will have an increase and decrease of urinary urea nitrogen depending on how much protein you intake but when you have a low protein intake you're going to have a low urinary urea nitrogen. I have uh, some data here comparing blood urea nitrogen and protein in the urine because they are often confused but those two variables BUN and protein in the urine are not indicative of inadequate protein intake. They're indicative of liver disease, kidney disease, other variables that would influence that, but it is the urinary urea nitrogen that is going to be impacted by low dietary protein intake. When it comes to assessing reduced tissue or reduction in somatic protein, there are a couple ways we can do this. One is through anthropometric measurements. We could measure calf circumference and midarm muscle circumference, and then compare them to NHANES reference values. Here are some guidelines that have been published and used to use anthropometric data to identify undernutrition, malnutrition. These are ill-defined, however, and they are 
fairly severe before we'd actually be able to identify and assess individuals. So they're not commonly used as a way to measure a, a specific stage of protein energy malnutrition. Hand grip strength is linked with the amount of lean body mass and has been found to be reduced when there's a reduction in somatic protein. So this is another method that can be used to assess the loss of somatic protein. The other way we will measure this reduction in tissue is by taking a look at nitrogen balance studies. The formula for nitrogen balance is taking a look at the dietary protein, which is our intake of, of nitrogen. So if we just divide our dietary protein by 6.25, we know how much intake of nitrogen we have. Our output of nitrogen would be from that urinary urea nitrogen and also a fixed amount of about 4 grams a day and that would be for things like our hair and our skin uh, and that does not alter because we eat more or less of protein so there's just a fixed amount. If the intake equals the output we're at equilibrium, most healthy adults are there. A positive balance meaning we're building protein so think about children growing, pregnancy, recovery from surgery but also muscle growth if you are weight training and gaining muscles. And the negative nitrogen balance would be adults with disease, any type of fasting or starvation where we're losing that lean body mass. We would see that change in a nitrogen balance studies. So these are three methods that can be used to measure that reduction in somatic proteins and the loss of strength associated with the reduction in lean body mass. The next stage of protein deficiency is looking at physiological and metabolic changes. Now often these changes are going to be reflected and measured by changes in plasma proteins such as albumin and transferrin. These proteins are carrier molecules. They carry minerals, vitamins, fatty acids, and hormones and are impacted by a large number of pathophysiological changes. Serum albumin is actually considered a quote-unquote testimony to general health. Normal levels are 3.5 to 5.0 grams per deciliter of blood and when it's very low, say below 2 grams per deciliter of blood, it is predictive of mortality. This relationship has been known for over 100 years, and albumin has been used as a marker for malnutrition for most of that time. We now know, however, that the, with the exception of extremely low levels of protein, say levels of protein of less than 3% of total calories, serum albumin is not a suitable marker for malnutrition. As stated earlier, the body will catabolize or break down its muscle mass in deference to maintaining these functional and regulatory proteins, including albumin. In other words, the body is sacrificing its muscle mass to provide the amino acids to maintain the production of blood proteins. Serum albumin will be preserved with classic malnutrition, i.e. starvation from a lack of dietary intake. In fact, there is no laboratory test that is both sensitive to and specific for protein assessment. Given this, one might conclude blood proteins, such as serum albumin, should not be considered when assessing protein status and malnutrition, but that is incorrect too. To understand why, we need to consider all types of malnutrition. One all-encompassing definition of malnutrition is a decline in lean body mass with the potential for functional impairment. Inadequate protein and energy intake obviously leads to this, but so does inflammation. Many chronic diseases and acute injuries and infections cause inflammation, which in turn leads to a loss of lean body mass and altered nutrient needs. The nutrition and medical community now recognize these three types of malnutrition. The first type is starvation-related malnutrition and includes pure chronic starvation and anorexia nervosa. The second type is called chronic disease-related malnutrition. And this would include diseases such as chronic obstructive lung disease, diabetes mellitus, and even obesity. The third type is called acute disease-related malnutrition and would include things such as a critical illness, major infections and sepsis, major surgeries or traumas, and severe burns. This brings us back to albumin. Inflammation leads to a hypoalbuminemia, low levels of serum albumin to a mild or moderate degree with chronic diseases, but at marked levels of a reduction for acute injuries and disease. So serum albumin is not a valid marker for a stage of protein deficiency or malnutrition, but it is a marker of inflammation, and inflammation is a potent contributor to a loss of body mass and malnutrition. So assessing serum protein is part of assessing protein status.
Now you may have noticed that there's a reoccurring theme here when it comes to these various methods for measuring the changes in each stage of protein deficiency. There are problems. Dietary needs vary by age, activity, and disease. U urinary urea is not commonly collected or measured. Methods for measuring somatic proteins have ill-defined cutoffs and are only seen after significant losses. Plasma proteins are related to malnutrition, but are not markers for protein status. But despite all these problems, malnutrition has measurable and important adverse effects on health and clinical outcomes, so assessment is important. Here's a graphic with a representation of how to assess malnutrition. There are six characteristics that are looked at. Weight loss, inadequate energy intake, loss of muscle mass, loss of subcutaneous fat, fluid accumulation, and hand grip strength. If an individual has at least two of these characteristics, malnutrition can be diagnosed. The presence of inflammation then is used to identify the type of malnutrition. Assessing the type of malnutrition is important because the body responds to nutrition support in different ways with each type. This graphic demonstrates what happens to lean body mass with each type of malnutrition and then when nutrition support of more energy and protein is provided. With starvation-related malnutrition, there's a loss of lean body mass, and when nutrition support is provided, the body stops that loss of lean body mass and recovers quickly. With acute disease-related malnutrition, there's a rapid loss of lean body mass. Providing nutrition support has limited effect. The body will continue to lose lean body mass at a rapid rate until it shifts into recovery mode. That time frame will vary with the level of disease or trauma. With chronic disease-related malnutrition, there's a slower rate of loss of lean body mass. Providing more protein can slow this loss, but until the inflammation is controlled, the loss will continue. In summary, assessing protein status and related malnutrition involves reviewing dietary, anthropometric, and biochemical measures. Although there is no one marker that determines definitively inadequate intake, understanding the need for protein in combination with exercise is important for maintaining optimal muscle function and health.